The 16th G7 summit took place in Houston, Texas, with the leaders of the top economies in the world descending on President Bush's home turf. After a very Texan opening event featuring, and I quote, armadillo races, bull riding, barrel racing, calf scrambling, the Grand Ole Opry, an Old West Village, cowboys and Indians, oil rigs, square dancing, a sheriff with silver spurs, styrofoam cacti, a model of the space shuttle, horseshoe contests, 1,250 gallons of barbecue sauce and jalapenos, 500 pounds of onions, 5,000 servings of cobbler and carrot cake, and 650 gallons of lemonade and iced tea, Maureen Dowd reporting in the New York Times, the leaders of Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the UK and the US, and the European community discussed matters including the developing situation in the USSR and Eastern Europe, the looming recession occasioned by the US savings and loan crisis, and climate change. A case brought by a Mrs Foster against British Gas, who had required her and other women to retire at age 60, which she contended was sex discrimination, ended up before the European Court of Justice. The European Directive on Equal Treatment only applied to member states, but given British Gas had been a nationalised industry at the time, Foster's lawyers argued it should have applied. The judgment, which found in favour of Mrs Foster, ended up being a very important part of the way that the European community defined what did and didn't constitute a state going forwards, which would have implications for future moves towards European integration. Following the World Cup in Italy, where England had progressed all the way to the semi-finals without notable crowd trouble, UEFA elected not to extend the five-year ban on English clubs playing in European competitions, which had been in place since the Heysel disaster of 1985. League champions Liverpool, whose fans had been directly involved at Heysel, had been banned for an additional six years, so would not take part in the European Cup next year, but runners-up Aston Villa would enter the UEFA Cup, and FA Cup winners Manchester United would enter the European Cup Winners' Cup. In Canada, a land dispute between the town of Oka in Quebec on the outskirts of Montreal and a group of First Nations people from the Mohawk Nation turned into a siege. The town had constructed a nine-hole golf course back in 1959 alongside a Mohawk cemetery despite the protests of the Mohawk, and now developers wanted to expand to the full 18 holes and add 60 condos. Protests had been made and ignored, and on the 11th of July a group of protesters blockaded access to the site, leading to a tense standoff with police, which escalated as both sides brought in reinforcements. It became something of a cause celebre among First Nations people from across Canada and the northern US, hundreds of whom travelled to join the protests, which soon spread, blocking off both the town of Oka and the Mercier Bridge linking Montreal city centre with its southern suburbs, leading to traffic chaos and a number of accidents. For their part, the Sûreté de Québec called in their emergency response team, who tried to force the blockade, but in the ensuing exchange of gunshots, an officer was killed. Things were only going to get worse. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union elected a new Politburo and Congress, its 28th, which swept aside most of the existing members and introduced instead a much weakened party apparatus, with the Politburo now consisting of the party heads of all the constituent republics, which in turn meant they could no longer meet weekly. Apart from President Gorbachev, nobody on the Politburo now had a role in the government. It was a much weakened body which only served to stoke the belief that the USSR itself was on the verge of collapse. After England had come agonisingly close to World Cup glory and Scotland had come equally agonisingly close to progressing through the group stage for the first time, British fans were looking to Nigel Mansell to bring a bit of sporting cheer to the summer. For his part, Nigel was just as keen to do well in front of his adoring public, but the rumours were stronger than ever that he was fed up with the team, convinced the unreliability that was plaguing him was down to the team focusing on Prost, just as they'd focused on him to Burger's detriment in 1989. There were positives though. Ferrari had beaten McLaren fair and square twice in a row now, and Nigel always went well at Silverstone. But while Mansell was the focus of the media frenzy, there was plenty more going on in the pit lane. For one thing, this would be the last year for the current configuration of the track, as lap times are approaching the minute mark or 160 mile an hour average speed, and Tom Walkinshaw had helped fund a lower speed but higher challenge circuit ready for 1991, with the construction crews around the track waiting to swing into action as soon as the crowds departed on Monday morning. Just as last year, it was the eighth race of the season marking the midpoint and for the smaller teams, the last chance to score points to get out of or avoid dropping into pre-qualifying. There were celebrations for Ricardo Patrese, who was contesting his 200th Grand Prix. 
He was already the driver with the most starts. He broke the record every race, but 200 obviously a particular milestone, and a cake and balloons were provided by Renault, in their company colours of course, for the photo op. There were quieter celebrations for Thierry Bootsen too, who celebrated his 33rd birthday on the Friday of race weekend, following the birth of his first child, Kevin, the day after the last race in France. With just a week between races, there were a few car changes, though Brabham finally had their transverse gearbox married to the new rear suspension and had high hopes for the second half of the season. Benetton, meanwhile, had new higher revving Ford motors, but with only two built, they decided to qualify the old ones and then race the new. Pre-qualifying saw the LaRousse Lola's top of the pile yet again, the team hopeful that this would be the last time they'd need to do this after Eric Bernard's point at Monaco. Tarquini came through in the AGS again and was joined by Guiar, with Moreno just missing out ahead of Langes, Gasho and Giacomelli. It was the last straw for the Coloni Subaru partnership and it was announced after the race that the little Italian team would complete the season with customer Ford DFR engines. Is motor racing, this was a new project and a new engine and it really we had quite a few problems with it and today even more. It's a shame because, you know, Three years ago I came here with Formula 3000 and uh, I was on pole position with a time which was as quick as what I did today. Life, only seven seconds off the next slowest car, had hoped to have their ex-Lotus Judd engines for Silverstone, but the deal had been postponed amid rumours the team just hadn't got the money for them, although the team themselves said they were simply still working on modifying the chassis. Friday's qualifying session saw the McLarens on top with Mansell third, but on Saturday the home hero pulled out a Silverstone special to take pole by over half a second from Senna at an average speed of 158 miles an hour, with Berger third alongside Bootsen and Prost back in fifth, nine tenths off his teammate. A lazy was sixth, having apparently not got the memo that this was a power circuit and he only had a V8 engine, with Petrese eighth. Bernard and Suzuki were a fantastic 8th and 9th, with Ivan Capelli 10th and hoping to continue his good form from France. The Benettons, with their older engines, were back in 11th and 13th, bracketing Nakajima's Tyrrell, but they would hope to progress with the new motor on race day. PK apparently so confident, he'd put £400 on himself to win at 40-1. to 1. The other home drivers, Donnelly and Warwick in the Lotus Lamborghinis, were 14th and 16th. The Brabham's new gearbox didn't seem to make much difference, with Modena down in 12th and Brabham not qualifying. If LaRousse were hoping to make it out of pre-qualifying, Ligier were in danger of dropping in, needing to score at least a point and for LaRousse not to score any more. Maurizio Gugelman changed his engine after the warm-up, but the new one refused to fire on the dummy grid too, so he was wheeled back into the pits. Unfortunately for him, the problem was the fuel pump and couldn't be fixed, so he went down as a DNS and the remaining 25 cars lined up around Woodcut. When the lights went on, Mansell got away well and moved left to block Senna, but the Brazilian had got an even better start and squiggled through the gap to take the lead, with Berger slotting into third as they went through Cops. Bootsen was fourth, then Prost, with the lazy trying to get through and take the place before having to defend his own position from the bicentennial man Petrese. As they finished the first lap then, it was Senna, Mansell, Berger, Bootsen, Prost, Lazy, Petrese, Suzuki, Capelli, Nanini, Bernard and the low tie of Donnelly and Warwick that the cameras followed around Cops. PK, meanwhile, had stalled off the grid and got away at the back, and while he'd passed five cars in that first lap, he'd have a bit of work to do to recover his bet. Up front, Nigel Mansell was sticking close to Senna's rear all the way through the opening laps, unwilling to allow his rival to open out an advantage. Behind them, Petrese had got past Delazy into sixth, as the Frenchman had already blistered his Pirellis and came in for a new set on lap seven. On lap nine, Mansell had a go at Senna at bridge, but outbraked himself and Senna was back through. On lap 12, Prost had to go at Bootsen, but was outpowered by the Renault, and about the same time Mansell got past Senna into the lead at Bridge. With a mighty roar from the crowd, Mansell immediately started pulling away, and a couple of laps later Senna made an uncharacteristic error at the exit to club and went bouncing across the grass, rejoining fifth but with dirty flat-spotted tyres. So it was Mansell leading Berger with Bootsen and Prost still scrapping hard over fourth, which Prost finally took on lap 16, just as Senna peeled in for new boots and rejoined tenth. As he was leaving, Petrese was pulling in from fifth, having had an off-camera shunt with Nanini, which had put the Benetton out on the spot. Petrese's stop was a long one as they checked his car over for damage, and he rejoined back down in 20th. All of which put a 16-second gap between the top four, Mansell, Berger, Prost and Bootsen, and Aguri, Suzuki and Ivan Capelli running close together in fifth and sixth, 
while Pico was captured on Eric Bernard's camera passing the Lola to go up to 7th on lap 18, just as Capelli got past Suzuki and set fastest lap in the process. The top three came past Alio and Tarquini, having a great scrap towards the back, with Boots and following, but suddenly Berger was right with Mansell, whose engine had started making some funny noises. Gerhard was straight past, but Nigel seemed to get things under control again and was able to stay ahead of Prost, and the top three began running very close together. Nakajima's electrics went at just under one-third distance, just the fourth retirement so far, joining Martini, De Cesaris and Nanini, plus Gugelman as a non-starter. Capelli was charging now, setting another fastest lap, lapping two seconds faster than Berger, who was starting to pull away from Mansell as the leaders came round to pass Warwick and Barilla. Capelli had the gap to boots and down to eight seconds, while the Belgian was being left behind by the top three. On lap 26, Patrese peeled into retire, his undertray having been broken when it was rear-ended by Nanini, and the car proving undrivable, so not a happy 200th race for Ricardo. Mansell, meanwhile, had seemingly got his car back under him again and took the lead back off Berger on lap 28 at Bridge. Berger looked both sides on the start-finish straight but couldn't do anything about it. There was another almighty cheer, and a couple of laps later they came round to lap Alboreto, and Prost followed at the same spot to make it a Ferrari 1-2 as half-distance approached. Senna, meanwhile, seemed to be having problems, still stuck back in ninth, having passed Martin Donnelly but no one else, while Capelli, now sounding rough with the cracked exhaust but still going great guns, had caught Bootsen, and Piquet was right behind Suzuki looking for that last point. He took it on lap 32, the half-distance lap, as Booten continued to try to stave off Capelli. Unsuccessfully, as the Leighton House got past the Williams on lap 33, despite the considerable power advantage of the V10 Renault over the V8 Judd. It seemed like, at least on the smoother circuits, the setup, balance and aerodynamics of the car seemed to give the Leighton House the edge. Capelli now set about whittling down the 10 seconds gap to third-place Berger, while Alesi made his second stop as he continued burning through his tyres, trying to make up for his down-on-power engine. The leading pair lapped Caffey, who was fighting his own battle with Tarquini, and didn't see Mansell approaching, bulking him just enough to give Prost the chance to pass on lap 43, and a couple of laps later Capelli scrambled past Berger for third, McLaren having a bad day at the office so far, and Capelli absolutely flying just as last week. It wasn't to last, though five laps later Capelli was touring, a fuel leak having put paid to his hopes of another podium finish. About the same time, Derek Warwick pulled over with a dead Lamborghini, and two laps later he was joined by his teammate Martin Donnelly with the same problem. So it was all down to Mansell as far as British drivers were concerned, with just 15 laps to go, Prost led by five seconds, with Berger having regained third, Boots and plugging away in a lonely fourth, PK a distance back in fifth, and Senna having now moved up thanks to the retirements in 6th and closing on his own rival just 6 seconds behind Piquet. Both Ferraris passed Eric Bernard, who again had a rear-facing camera on his car, with Mansell still putting pressure on Prost as the race entered its last 10 laps. It was looking like a second Ferrari 1-2 on the trot, until suddenly with 9 laps to go, Mansell's arm stuck out of his cockpit, his engine popping, banging and revving all over the place as his gearbox finally gave out. He pulled over onto the grass just past the end of the pit lane, rolled back as far as he could to save himself the walk, and climbed out. He gave the fans a wave, threw his gloves and balaclava into the crowd and walked back to the pits, putting a brave face on what must have been a galling disappointment for him. He later had a word with former race driver and BBC pit reporter Jonathan Palmer. Nigel, absolutely appalling luck. Tell us what happened. Hi. After ten laps, once I got into the lead... The gearbox started changing down automatically on its own. That's why they caught me so quick, that's why they were able to pass me. Then it would go a couple of laps and it would work properly. And then at the end there was no gears at all, but I was, I was racing and staying ahead of Alan with it changing gear automatically on its own down. I mean, I have to say that, you know, I've got to be careful what I say, but one car works perfect. I just don't understand why mine has problems. While all that was going on, PK had a spin and nearly collected Senna, who was soon passed into what was now fourth, while Nelson recombobulated himself. Prost now had an enormous lead of some 26 seconds over Gerhard Berger with Boots in third, while Mansell's retirement had put Bernard back up into sixth for that vital point for LaRousse. Which became fifth, when Berger rolled to a stop with a broken throttle with just four laps to go, 
which also promoted Aguri Suzuki into sixth place, the first time ever that both LaRousse cars had run in the points. Prost began his last lap having just lapped Bernard and suddenly was avoiding wreckage on the road. Wreckage with green paint on it. A little further up the road was PK going slowly. Prost slowed up, Bernard didn't, and unlapped himself and took fourth in the same move while Prost stuck behind Nelson to cruise home for his fifth British Grand Prix win, leaving Bernard and PK to fight one more lap. But having damaged some bodywork in the spin, which had then fallen off, hence the wreckage on the track, the triple champion just wasn't able to recover the place, and the jubilant LaRousse team finished in fourth and sixth points, their best ever finish, and Aguri Suzuki's first career point. Thierry Bootsen came in second, and Senna a somewhat lucky third after struggling with handling problems the whole race. Alex Caffey drove a quiet race to take seventh ahead of a lazy, and while both Ligiers finished, they hadn't done enough and would be forced to suffer the indignity of pre-qualifying from Germany onwards. Prost, meanwhile, moved to the top of the driver's table by two points. The first time, actually, since 1987 that anyone not wearing McLaren overalls had topped the table, while Bootsen closed to within a point of PK in fourth place, and Williams overtook Benetton into third overall. And then after the race, the biggest bombshell of all. Nigel Mansell announced that he would retire at the end of the year, his 10th full season of Formula 1. He seemed cheerful enough and insisted it was something he'd been thinking about for some time rather than a fit of petulant foot stamping. It's something that's been going on for some time and uh, my wife uh, in the 26 years uh, we've been together really, uh, well 20 years certainly plus, um, said to me a couple of times this year, don't you think it's time? And uh, it was a decision that was being thought about carefully for about the last, probably about four months. And for me, um, I just think it's very, very important that um, you know, I let people know. I'm, I've always been honest in my, in my job and uh, my profession. And uh, the timing's perfect. I was hoping, actually, um, to announce it uh, from the press room uh, hopefully with a win, because I mean, I was very confident that we were going to be quick enough, and I think as I demonstrated in the race, we were right there. But I mean, it wasn't to be, and uh, and then uh, certain people said to me, who knew what I was going to do, oh, the timing's wrong, you know, people say it's a reaction, and this, that, and the other, but no, no, I think people will think what they, what they want to think. The most important thing is, is what we know and what we think ourselves, and uh, I've had a fantastic career, but I think for the first time in my life I'm going to put my family and my three children first, and uh, I think that's very, very important. On saying that, I'll be charging right until the end of the year.